you can see. Okay, um, great. So um, please, um, I, I, I should probably start by saying what I'm going to talk about. I'm going to talk about um, you know, privacy and machine learning and some evaluations of how private machine learning is, both with and without um, privacy enhancement techniques. Um, I would prefer if people like sort of interrupt me as I go and ask questions on whatever is you think is interesting. Um, the way that I structured the talk is roughly divided into three pieces about three different papers. So after I move a section, like the time has sort of passed to ask about the previous paper, I'm not really going to come back to the thing. Uh, so I'll pause and tell you, like now I'm going to move to something completely different. Of course, they're all related, but um, please don't just wait until the very end for questions because it it'll be easier for everyone if you ask them like right when you have them. Um, and just feel free to interrupt. Don't, well, I don't know, raise hand or whatever. I, I can't see that. Just sort of say, Nicholas, what you said makes doesn't make sense here. Um, okay. <clears throat> so um, general setup is, um, you know, we have machine learning now that's being trained and also to private data. Um, so there's this um, thing from last year saying using machine learning to on medical imaging of people's medical image scans. You have machine learning being used on text messages and on people's emails. And as a result, um, you really have to make sure that when you're using machine learning, it's not going to go and leak a bunch of information to um, the other people from one person's training data um, to another person. Because for example, like, you know, the Smart Compose like actually does train on real user data and predictions from one user um, are influenced by the training data of other users. And so we want to make sure that this kind of thing doesn't happen in, in any bad way. Um, so um, this way that I set this, up, set this up is the first part is sort of just a question on like, does machine learning actually leak training data in, in this kind of way? Like, is the threat real or is it just something that like, you know, we could say like, you know, mathematically it possibly could happen. And so we should therefore study it or does it actually happen? And then the second part is, um, well, spoilers, it does happen. Uh, the second part is how do we prevent it from happening um, given that it does? Uh, okay, so let's start with um, this this first question of does this happen? Um, and this is. Oh, sorry. Does have a question? No. Okay. Um, <clears throat> okay. So so the, let's start with with this first question, and we're going to try and measure things empirically. Um, and so there's this big language model that OpenAI has released. Um, that's called GPT two. They released it in 2019. Um, they've since released a bigger version, um, but uh, when we started this work, they hadn't. And um, so the question here is, this is a language model that was trained on a bunch of text data scraped from the internet. And so given that it was sort of exactly the setup that I showed you earlier, a language model that's trained on data from the internet, um, does it memorize any personal information about people or anything else that we might consider um, unwanted in some way. So <clears throat> the way that we're going to figure this out is kind of like the, the simplest thing you could ever try. Um, the way a language model works is you feed in some input, um, and then the sort of the model goes and does its thing. And it doesn't really matter how it does it for this talk. Uh, it just generates text at the output. So you say, like, this is a random input. And then it says like, and here's what I think is the next most likely continuation. And here it's, you know, this is like an actual generation from GPT-2. Like it semantically is somewhat meaningful um, and everything makes sense here. And the way that you generate these is it doesn't spit this out all at once. It spits it out token by token. And so it will, you say, this is a random input and it says, and. And then you say, this is a random input and, and then it says probability. And then you say, this is a random input or, and probably, and then, like it goes sequence by sequence. And at each token, you can ask how likely the next one is. It will give you a distribution over all words and you just pick maybe the most likely word or something. So um, this is what GPT-2 does. Um, now you can do this not for just one input, but you can do this for, for whatever inputs you want. Uh, if you feed in something that's relatively sort of weird, um, it tries to just make sense of it and just spits out something that um, happens to be likely English that maybe isn't re so related to the input text at all. Um, but, um, you know, it, it, it understands, like, it really latches onto battery here. 
like it, it tries to generate some text that has to do with um, you know advertising and batteries or something. Uh, quick question. Yeah. Uh, how uh, random is this, or is it like, or is yeah, there yeah, right. either randomness or something? Yeah, yeah. So um, there are different ways to sample, um, and uh, I will touch on that a little bit later. But you can think of what's happening is that it has a probability distribution over all possible output words that it could spit out, and there are different ways you could t you can sample from this distribution. Um, you can take top one, you can uniformly sample from all the entire distribution, you can clip to the top 40 and then sample and then sample from the top 40. So you, um, can you sample like from the distribution, the actual distribution it thinks it? Uh, uh, yeah, so you, you can sample directly from this. Um, it turns out that this um, doesn't, people tend not to do this because, um, because the vocabularies are very big. Um, uh -huh. GPT-2's okay. vocabulary is something like 50,000 tokens. Um, just by random sampling, occasionally you pull out just like completely bizarre UTF-8, who knows what's. Yeah. Um, so, so just to be clear, if you if you uh, put correct horse battery, yes, uh, and you specify that you want like a list of the top K tokens, you'll always get the same list for GPT-2. Yes. Correct? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. That 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 is deterministic. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Other questions anyone has? Okay. Um, okay. Turns out there's also that you can occasionally find inputs where when you query with this input um, and you say like, you know, East Stroudsburg, Stroudsburg, Pennsylvania, uh, it like gives you this guy's personal contact information, uh, which isn't great. Um, this is like a real output from GPT-2. I mean, I, I've, so I've elided a little bit of text that comes right before this, but this is a, um, a straight output from GPT-2, um, which, um, this person is a cryptographer at IBM. Um, they have their name attached to some documentation that was on the internet. GPT-2 crawled this uh, documentation and decided that um, even though he has nothing to do with, with whatever this input prompt is, that it's going to output this output text. Um, OK, so, the, so this, this, is, this is what happens, it just like sort of completely benignly by just querying it a lot of times. So how did we find this particular input? Well, what we did is we just asked GPT-2 for lots and lots and lots of data. We sort of just did the random querying thing a whole bunch of different times um, until we got something like a megabyte of text, just maybe a, a mil roughly a million tokens. <clears throat> and then um, we just sort of ask which of these million tokens are memorized. Um, and the answer is like uh, these ones. Um, and I'll talk in a second about how we find these, but um, basically we just find that by doing straight normal generation out of GPT-2, we can get like people's names that come out of um, things. We can get news headlines that um, are sort of verbatim. These may, this maybe isn't so surprising. This example on the bottom here is one of, um, uh, this is a URL with the UUID encoded into it, which um, is sort of as, about as random as you can get. Um, and so there are lots of different things that we can we can find from the model just by asking it to generate just what it thinks of as high quality text. Um, okay, so the question here is, you know, how do we do this magic filtering to de determine which things are memorized and which things aren't? Um, and again, we do again probably the simplest thing. We just compare the likelihood ratios um, uh, in order to predict what text is memorized. And what I mean by likelihood ratio is take any other model which was not trained on the same data or which is different in some way or which is smaller and just look for data that the model that generated it thinks is very likely and some other model thinks is unlikely. Um, because, you know, the tech, the model that saw the data probably thinks that this is, you know, it's, the reason it spit it out is because it thinks it's at least somewhat high quality text. Um, but another model, which is roughly is around as good, but not hasn't seen this exact same data will not think that this text is nearly as likely as it was, especially for things like UUIDs, which should just have 128 bits of randomness. But, but here, when you prefix the, the URL, it just spits out the same UUID every time. Um, okay, so, so in particular, what do we do? Um, so the way this is sort of a figure from, from the paper, the way you should read this is on the rows, <coughs> we have here six different ways of, um, of, of comparing likelihoods of like the likelihood of the two models. And on the columns, we have different ways of sampling from the model. So for now, let's just look at the text generation strategy top N, which is the first column. 
And what we have is we have here six different ways of evaluating. So we just generate a bunch of text with standard top n um, generation, which just means um, sample according to the probability distribution, looking only at the top n tokens, where here n is like 40. Um, so this is this is, and the reason why we picked this is this is the standard way that people generate from language models. So if you just like run GPT-2 out of the box, you download the code and run it, this is what will happen. And um, so, and then we generate uh, 200,000 possible to, um, sequences with this, and we check which of them are mem memorized. And the way we check do this check is we have a bunch of different ways here. So the perplexity is the simplest one, which just says, just look at how likely the model thinks this text is and sort by that. And we look at 100 possible tokens, uh, 100 possible sequences and find nine of these 100 are, are memorized. And to determine this, this final check of is it actually memorized, we do a bunch of manual work. Um, and so just looking, even this, the trivial thing of just looking of saying, is this, mem is this high, high probability is, if it is pretty good at detecting memorization. But then we have a couple of other ways Small and medium. Oh, I mean, what were the hundred? What were the hundred? What's the hundred? I see. Okay. Um, sorry. Yes. So we we take the two hundred thousand generations, we sort them all according to whatever metric we have. Take top hundred. And then we take the top hundred. Sorry, if you're talking, I can't hear. Okay. Um, yeah. Um, and so small and medium here, I mean, just compare to the GPT-2 variants of, that are smaller and in, in, small size and medium size. The one that we're running is a large size. So even though these are, these are trained on the same data, they're just, um, they're a little bit smaller and they have less, less capacity to memorize. And um, so somehow like these memorize fewer things. And so we can like half of the things that we test roughly or a third of the things we test are memorized that are output um, uh, among this top hundred. Um, and then we also you can compare to like zlib entropy you know like you want to filter out just like you know if, if you just count numbers um that like might be high that might be high likelihood but is not going to have good um, good entropy according to zlib or over some sliding window or by comparing to a lowercase version of the text there are lots of things this is not representative this is just some ideas that we came up with and that happened to work reasonably well it's i think it's entirely likely that there will exist like a much better strategy on this row um and then you can consider the columns, which is how you generate text. And we considered three different ways. This first one, as I said, is just do whatever was done um, in, in the code by default. Um, there are some other strategies that we tried. Um, temperature was something that we thought would work better. It doesn't, so I'm not going to talk about it much. Um, internet search just means um, instead of prompting with, with nothing and just going from, from no prompt, we start with some some prompts from the internet. This is like these, these first couple words, um, just to encourage the model to have, be more diverse in its outputs. So it's not always starting from the same empty sequence and just generating um, outputs from, from nothing. It's starting from you know maybe a couple words that um, I showed you earlier in order to generate more diverse outputs. And this tends to work reasonably well. Uh, and in the best case, something like uh, you know almost two thirds of, of things that we check are actually memorized. And again, I expect that there will exist a much better column that could have, um, elicit much more memorization. But these are just three baseline strategies, again, that we've tried here. And the reason why we picked these combinations is to show that even if there's not an adversary present who's like trying to pull things out of a model, like if you just run GPT-2, like so at the end of this, we have like roughly one in a thousand things is probably memorized that GPT-2 spits out. So like if, if you just run GPT-2 and you like give it to users and you do a million gener generations, like a thousand of those generations are going to be memorized user data that's being spit out to people. So like on absolute terms, this is a small number, but like it's a sufficiently large number that like if you were like you want to do something to stop this. Uh, questions here about this before I, I'm going to show one more table and then I'm going to move on. Yeah, sorry. I just want to square what you just said about something like one in a thousand things. In okay. Yes. G yeah. I, I want to square that with this chart, which makes it look like up to 60 out of a hundred uh, things. Yeah. Might yeah. Be memorized. Okay. Good. Yes. So because we sorted based on um, the likelihood ratios, what, so what, what I did is I started with 200,000 and then I went down to the top hundred and of those 60 are memorized, but we still have the remaining, you know, 199,000, uh, you know, 900, right. whatever. That explains it, thank you. Yeah, and I expect that you know things decay pretty quickly. And so we a lot of the tail won't be memorized at all, but um, 
from what from a little bit we looked at looks like maybe one in a thousand total um, tokens on average yeah my question nicholas yeah. go ahead uh, you did this on gpt2 my understanding is gpt3 is far more sophisticated yeah what's your opinion how this would have changed had you done this on gpt3 yeah um yeah so we so I, um i'm not certain but here's here's the one anecdote i can tell you GPT. So I, I I haven't I've never queried GPT three, but OpenAI when they released GPT three also released um, a, some some just text samples that they that they said here is here are some sample outputs. Um, I manually looked through a, a, a hundred of those, and just like tried to see if each if if any of these were memorized text, and one of them was. So like extremely low sample size, one in a hundred things are memorized. But like this really meant one out of a hundred. Like the error bars here are huge. Like I could have gotten lucky and it could be one in a thousand, or I could have gotten unlucky and it could be three in a hundred. Uh, I don't know. Um, but yeah, I know that G it still happens with GPT three, and um, the model is much bigger, so things are, are likely to be in some sense worse. Which maybe is a perfect um, thing for my next slide, which is this. Um, so. Um, okay, what I'm showing you here is on the on the rows. These are different URLs that the model has has, has memorized, or potentially could have memorized that we know were in the training data. Um, the the total here is the total number of times that each of these URLs occurred in the training data. And then on the final part, we have is this memorized by one of three models: the extra large model, the medium model, and the small model. Um, which has uh, respectively 1.5 billion parameters, 300 million parameters, and 100 million parameters. And what we find is the bigger models memorize a lot more. Um, even though you have like 100 million parameters, which I don't know, a couple of years ago we would have said is insanely huge, um, it's still the case that going from 100 million to a billion gives you 10 times more memorization. Uh, GPT-3, for reference, is 100 million. Is, sorry, it's 100 billion parameters. So we, we've already gotten 100 times bigger than the left column here. Um, so yes, so things are, are pretty bad. Um, in particular, with GPT-2, um, roughly 33 insertions for this kind of URL happens to be enough to make it be memorized. Um, but it's entirely possible um, that some other sequences are easier or harder to memorize. Um, but this sort of just gives one nice sort of glimpse into how model size might make a difference, where bigger models memorize a lot more um, across the board. Nic Nicholas, is this like, do you feel this is just like a quantitative difference? Or mm -hmm. is there some qualitative change when I get to a certain parameter or ratio between data set size and parameter? Or just no idea? Yeah, I have no idea. We haven't done uh, so. So. We are currently running experiments to try and answer this question. Um, for this paper, we just sort of took the pre-trained models that we have. We didn't do, do any like, um, you know, controlled experiments or anything. We just took the model and see what happens. Um, we're currently trying to answer this question um, and hopefully we'll know soon. Cool. Yeah. Um, yeah, I'm going to move on to the next thing. So if there's any final questions on this, um, let me know. Um, yeah, so it seems like the strategies here pull out memorized text in general. Do you have like a specific phishing strategy that searches for people? Like, can you count the number of people whose personal data has been memorized by this thing? Yeah, this is a great question. And no, we can't do this, or at least we didn't try. Um, the, the main thing that we're looking for here is not some like, uh, you know, operationalized, I want to submit to Black Hat uh, thing, but just like, uh, what happens like on the, like what what is memorized? Not, not like how would I find you know like I really don't like you. I want to find all the things the model knows about you. Um, so like we can find someone's phone number, but not necessarily your phone number. But no, I, I completely believe that with some intelligent search, um, this should in principle be possible. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah, so, so this is possible. Um, models memorize things. And so like, it's not like some, you know, uh, people being scared about like what might happen. Like this is a real thing that happens even in like these benign generation strategies where you're not trying all that hard to spit out memorized text, these models just do. Um, so what do we do about it? Um, 
So <clears throat> the first thing I'm going to talk about um, here is a, is a recent paper um, that tries to introduce a way to prevent this, um, which is this proposal. It's called Instahide. Um, this was a paper at um, ICML, which got a bunch of attention for proposing a way to train models with privacy, basically for free, without, sacrifice it, without sacrificing accuracy. Um, and so the idea is that um, here I'm going to work with um, CIFAR 10 images of moving away from language modeling onto and just small images. Um, so th these images are blurry. That's intentional. They're 32 by 32 pixels because uh, that's where this 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 defense works. Um, so instead of doing like this image to model mapping where you take think about training images and train a model, um, what what Instahide is going to do is it's going to construct a private version of these images that's somehow um, you know privacy preserving, and then it's going to train a model on these privacy preserving images with the property that when you train on these privacy preserving images, somehow it still learns to solve the original task well. And so like, you don't even need to do anything special in the training phase. Just create the data set in a private way. And then now you can just say that any learning algorithm when run on this private data set is also going to be a private, produce a private model because the data set was private to begin with. Um, and this is the claim that's made. And um, so why Instahide, um, I mean, like, right, it's received a whole bunch of attention. It's like a place at this Bell Labs prize. Um, uh, people sort of widely talked about it, like what it could do. Um, and so let me tell you how it works. Um, what it does is it has a private data set and a public data set. The private data set is all the things that are sensitive that I care about. Maybe some my medical images, my personal text messages, whatever. And the public data set is just things that you can find that are not private. This is like data from the internet. And so what Instahide does is it randomly pulls two images from your private data set and two images from your public data set, um, takes these images, uh, smashes them together to generate um, a sort of a just like literally just like pixel wise blend. And then take this and then randomly flip the signs of, some of the pixels according to what they call a one time pad. Um, and then put this aside and call this um, your first encoded image. And then you repeat the process. You randomly sample two private images, two public images, uh, pixel wise blend them together. I, like, I'm, I'm skipping a couple details. There's some like lambda coefficients here. Um, you, you average them together, you get, you flip the signs again, you get another encoded image, and you do this a bunch of times until you have a bunch of encoded images. And now here's your private data set. And so, like, the argument is that this, this data set is privacy preserving and you can't use this data set to, to get any insight into what, the, what happens in the original data set. Um, and so I, you don't need to reason about it, well, training machine learning models or anything. You just need to reason about this fairly simple um, set of operations which are being done here to determine if, if this is actually preserving the privacy of the original training data. Okay. So the question is, um, is this scheme private? Uh, where now, like the previous thing was entirely about attacking machine learning model. This is entirely attacking about attacking something much more um, sort of simpler to define. And now one of the things that's um, a little difficult to say is, is the paper is not great about giving precise privacy guarantees about definitions, about what it like actually wants to achieve. Um, and so what we're going to do is we're going to aim for the strongest possible attack, uh, which is complete image reconstruction. Um, there are lots of other definitions that probably are also important, like um, differential privacy or something. But for now, like let's just see if it if it achieves even the weakest possible guarantee, which is given the encoded data set, I want to know is it possible to completely recover basically bit for bit or as close to it as possible the original images? Um, because if we can achieve this, then we could probably do anything else that we wanted, um, including some kind of membership inferences or tracing or something. Okay, is the setup so far clear? Is the algorithm relatively clear? Okay. So, okay, so the, basically the attack works in two steps. Um, and let me walk you through each of them. The first thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna cluster together images that are similar. And so what I mean by similar is I'm going to con construct a function f that works and tries to predict <laughs> if the images that I have share one of the original private images in common. So the image, this function f receives two encoded images, which I know like in the back of my mind, like I, I don't have access to this, but I just sort of know that it came from, each of these came from two private images. And so what I'm gonna try and do is I'm gonna try and make this function figure out, um, were, are any of these four images shared? And, and here the answer is no, and so this function should output zero. 
Um, if you know it happened to be the case that these two images shared that shared this frog in common, then the answer should be one. Um, all right, so how do I get this function f? This seems a little bit magic. Um, we train it with as a machine learning model. Um, the idea behind these uh, these these encodings is they should be neural network friendly because we want to train a model on them to be accurate in the first place. So we just run sort of the insta height algorithm on our own sensitive data, well, not really sensitive, but our, our own data sets where we know the ground truth and train it to be good at this function of guessing whether or not they have a shared image in common. And it can do this with something like 95% um, accuracy. And then we go and apply this function after it's been trained on our own data to some other data that we don't have access to. And what we do with this is we use this to build then a similarity graph, which literally just says for any pair of images, do we think that they have um, a, an image in common? And then you get some big noisy graph. And then using some, you know, complicated, not so complicated, but like a little bit more detailed um, things, you just cluster this graph into partitions. Um, I've drawn this here that it nicely separates, but in practice, um, there's, there's some noise in the edges. But um, you, you, we, we want to just pull out um, different clusters where the idea is each cluster now should correspond to one original source image. Um, so now we have to do the second piece, which is given these, these clustered images, we have to find some way to recover the original version of each of them. And this piece is actually also fairly straightforward. Um, and all we do here is we, we know that each of these came from the same original image. And the way that they were obtained was by pixel-wise blending with other images. So we're just going to do that again. We're just going to smash them all on top of each other and compute the pixel-wise mean. And we basically get the original image out. Now, I, I'm lying more here than in any other part so far. In order to get the, the signs out, you have to do a little bit of, of trickiness to get the signs out. Um, but um, this is essentially something that would give you um, what, what I described would give you good quality images. To get these really high quality images, you have to do a little bit more stuff. Um, but it's not so interesting to talk about the details here. Um, and so, okay, so, so what are the results like? Um, so uh, the authors release a challenge, which is great. Um, they release something that says, like, here, like, here's something we don't think people can solve. Um, try, and, um, try and do this. So we take their, their, their challenge and we solve it pretty perfectly. Um, now, they, they don't release the original images. So when I say original up here, um, I'm, again, lying a little bit. Um, what they, what they in, their ch in their code, they implemented things with a cryptographically insecure random number generator. And so by doing sort of a cryptanalytic attack on their scheme, we could just completely reverse out exactly what they did um, because they didn't have a secure random number generator. So we could just recover the original images. That's kind of cheating. Um, so, but I can use that as a ground truth to like evaluate how well our approach works. Um, and so um, I, I just mentioned this and, and no, I won't. Okay. Um, so let, let me just skip back and forth between the two images for a second. And so like, you can see that like, there is some difference between these two. Like we get like some of the pixels wrong and like the lighting is a little different, but like on the whole, they're pretty much the same images. And, and we can do this for basically their entire challenge data set. Um, so yeah, I guess the conclusion here is uh, InstaHide as the algorithm is not so private uh, in this way. Can I ask a question? So, so why did they use this particular algorithm? Uh, I mean, what was the what was their purpose in that, for that, using that algorithm? This was the this was this is what InstaHide is. It's this it's it's this process, sequence of steps. Um, it, they developed these sequence of steps, believing that it preserves privacy of the training data. But but they probably wanted to use something. They could still use the data for something. But otherwise, I, they you're going to train a machine learning model on it to do medical images or text generation, like I did for GPT-2. So like private learning. That was yeah, yeah. private learning. I see. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. yeah. I have a I have a question <laughs> about. So this is a this is you can say you know this is sort of out of scope, but like, is there some intuition for why? Learning is still possible with these images. Yeah, because the thing's not private. Exactly. Absolute value than like you can just sort of like squint and see some of the. Data. Exactly. Yes. So, so mix up is a thing that's done. In, in, when the paper sort of acknowledges that this. So mix up is something that's commonly done in machine learning, 
where you take two images and you pixelize blend between them. And you pick and, and then you linearly blend their labels. And like magically this improves learning somehow. Uh, it's sort of weird that it does, but- um, what, What's the what, what's mix of used for? Like what's the- Increasing generalization of machine learning models. Okay. Um, it like linearizes things or something. I don't know, that's what people say. Okay. Uh, empirically, it seems to help a little bit. Okay. Um, and so they add a sign flipping procedure on this, mm -hmm. but if you just take the absolute value, then like the sign flipping thing all goes away. Mm -hmm. And it becomes basically mix up, but a little more complicated. And so a model can learn on this okay, but their, their argument is that sign flipping is like a one-time pad. And that's why it should be private. And it, another question is about the clustering that you, you guys trained uh, this, this F function, right? Yes. Yeah. Um, what if you did just like the obvious thing and took the pixel-wise correlation between the two images with that? Yeah. Right, so it feels like if you're blending instead of four images, like a thousand images, um, that might, I don't know. I, yeah, 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 right. Having so, trouble expressing the intuition, but it seems like just pixel wise correlation might be enough. Yeah, so we, we, started, we started by trying with this. Um, it turns out that doing training and all that is actually better. Uh, I, I don't believe that there doesn't exist a nice, um, like well-described algorithm, which is better than what we've done. Uh -huh. um, like I, I can completely believe that someone thought really hard about the mathematics of what blending does, that they could write down an algorithm that's more accurate than ours. Straight correlation and dot product and a bunch of other similar things um, didn't, and like computed cosine similarities, like didn't. Got it. The first to five to 10 things one would try, like didn't give great results. You're just like, let's just stick it into a machine learning algorithm. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Awesome. And it worked well enough and we stopped there. Yeah. yeah. Thanks. Question on the, you said they did one time pad encryption. Then you said they did bit flipping. And then you said the failure was because they had a pseudo random number generator. Okay. Okay. Sorry. Yes. Okay. Crack, so. Yeah. Okay. So to clarify, um, so, so the bit flipping and the one time pad thing are the same thing. So, like where, what, so what they do, so if I go back to here, they, they, they take these original images and then they average them together and they get this, this averaged image. And then they want to flip the signs of some of the bits. And so what they do is they have a one-time pad is what they call um, to decide which of these pixels to flip. And so this is their one-time pad and their pixel flipping operation. Okay, so they didn't use a random key equal to the number of the bits in the picture and flip all the bits. So they flip, they, they, so you can think of what they're doing is they have a key in their mind. They use this to generate a one, um, it's not a one-time path, but like they, they have a key in their back of their mind. They, they, they follow some stream cipher or something and they get a bunch of bits. And if the bit is zero, you don't flip the pixel. If the bit is one, you do flip the pixel and you flip all the pixels according to this function. I think they did one bit per pixel instead of one bit per bit is the idea. Yeah, 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 right, exactly. Well, it, yeah, it's it, right. Yeah, so, so they're not like XORing like really like bitwise on top of each other. Yeah, they're, they're sort of sign flipping according to, to whether or not a, a pixel is zero, bit of zero or one. Okay, so it's not a true one-time pad encryption. No. Okay, now the next thing is you mentioned they use pseudo random numbers and yeah. that helps you when you're an attack. Yeah, and... so this is not like, so, so our, our real attack does not use this at all. Um, but in order to get ground truth solutions, we can do a completely separate attack that just exploits the fact that they messed up their, their encryption algorithm. And they're like, once, like the entire, like if we have the one time pad here, like, or, or this, like this, this thing, then we can just directly un undo the flipping operation. And then it's just a completely linear operation. We do single matrix inversion and everything sort of bits just fall out basically perfectly. So that's like a completely separate bug in their implementation, which, which is not fundamental to InstaHide. Like if, if they had just used a cryptographically secure random number generator, everything would have been fine. No, but your attack would still work uh, even if the random generator was- Yeah, the other attack would still work just fine. Just this yeah. ground truth that I, like, I couldn't show you like these, the, these, these pairs of images that, and say that things were like, that we, we knew it was good. So Nicholas, um, my question is, 
how much work are our brains doing in sort of assessing the similarity between your extracted images and the the original images like did you evaluate according to a loss function or something or yeah so l2 similarity is very high um structural similarity is very high um under give me a metric you care about and it's pretty high okay yeah thanks yeah. okay um, i want to get on to the last um last piece of this um uh which i think is sort of more, a more interesting piece um which Any question sure Any... so so do, do you have any idea, given your attack and your insight that you get, did, can you think of how one can fix their thing so that they can still get, you know, their goal of vulnerability and your attack and maybe so, other? Yeah, so our, our paper has some um, theoretical results that says basically uh, nothing like what they're doing can easily work. Uh, basically, so we have some results which say that if you can learn a function on top of encoded images, then it can't preserve some strong definition of privacy. Um, yes. It might be possible to present, prevent reconstruction, but at least some strong version of privacy can't be achieved if you can train machine learning models on the encoded images. Um, with, with all sorts of caveats that I don't really want to spend a lot of time getting. And that's kind of a mathematical statement. I don't understand it myself. Uh, this is sort of, we have cryptographers who know a lot more than this than me. Yes. What? But the same, but it's a mathematical statement. Yes, there's a statement that you can write down which says that under these conditions, this is true and you can't learn, um, yeah. Interesting, okay, yeah, thanks. Yeah, yeah and there's a paper online if you want to take a look. Um, okay. Um, yeah, so I guess this brings to the final section uh, of differential privacy where I want to talk about like something that like provably does pre preserve privacy, um, but we want to evaluate like Sort of do the other thing and say like here's something that actually is is private. We know it's private, but can we get some lower bounds on how private it is? Um, okay, so I guess the general setup. I'm, I'm probably most of you know this, but let me just introduce it a slightly different way, just because it will help later. In differential privacy, you have a data set A and a data set B, and they, we're using these to train some machine learning model where they differ in one record. Here, like there may be over emails, and the question in differential privacy is not we're not considering reconstruction. We're imagining, but like, let's say we just have the neural networks and we're gonna try and guess like, if the adversary can guess like, was this one trained on A or B with some probability greater than half, then we say that it's not differentially private. Um, and if, if they can only guess with probability half plus some, some negligible function, uh, then it is differentially private. Um, so this is what, what we mean by differentially private. Um, yeah, okay, so if, if, if they can't do this guessing game, then, then it's private. Um, so, um, what differential privacy proves is something very, very strong. And um, it says that an algorithm is private um, if the probability that any adversary can, can win the game on any data set for any example that's different is less than some threshold, like one half plus, plus, plus like, yeah, epsilon something. Um, and so, like, this is a ridiculously strong guarantee because, in practice, like, we might only have normal data sets we care about. Or we might not allow adversaries like infinite compute like to like suspend or, or something like this, and we might we might care about the privacy there. But differential privacy can't can't prove these things. Uh, but we, we, we might care what it looks like. Um, okay. So um, and when I say is less than a given threshold here. What I mean is um, roughly this is five epsilon that corresponds to the probability you could win the game. Um, if epsilon is zero, then you can never win the game. If epsilon is infinity, you can always win the game. And Roughly, you know, it grows sort of exponentially-ish, kind of, um, I mean, sigmoid, but whatever. Like, um, for small values of epsilon, it grows kind of exponentially. Um, so if we say we train with epsilon 1, then it means, I don't know, something like 1 in 1,000 times you can win. The numbers here are completely made up. This is all just for a slide. Um, OK. So you know, if we have some graph where like on, you know, the y-axis is like how much privacy there is. Like there's some upper bound guarantee by different privacy that says like you, you must be at least this private. And we want this number to be small, but in practice, lots of companies set epsilon to like 10 or something or three or, and get lots of hate for it. Um, probably rightly so in some kinds, cases um, because this is like only an upper bound. Um, and then there's reality, which is like, you know, how much memorization actually happens. And there's, there's a gap here because you know, our proof techniques aren't perfect, for example. 
Um, and then, you know, there exists some kind of lower bound. Um, and that's what we're going to try and achieve and try and like sort of bound the reality between this upper bound that we can prove and some lower bound with the concrete attack that says like, let's just construct an attack and see how, what value of epsilon we can show as a lower bound. And now we can say that reality falls somewhere in the middle. And we may not know where exactly in the middle, but we can bound it between these two ends. Um, okay, so, um, so the way that we're gonna do this is we're like actually going to construct this you know, hypothetical adversary that has to guess. Like we're gonna give a concrete algorithm that tries to predict for a data set, uh, for a trained model, which data set it was trained on. Um, and so let me just give you a couple reasons why I think it's interesting to, to do this. I gave you one of them, which is to like consider the tightness of the difference of privacy proofs. Um, this is one reason I think is interesting. Um, another reason, um, okay, I guess here's sort of the, the, the idea is, you know, you could have things that like either are very, very tight or you could have the bounds are very loose and it would be interesting to know which world we're living in. For example, for a long time, um, you know, if like you reanalyze the same algorithm with different analysis techniques, the upper bound would get lower by a, you know, a factor of 10. And so like the question, like, there's a question like, is there another factor of 10 just sitting there and just we need the mathematicians to think harder? Um, or is it, you know, maybe pretty tight? Um, there's also the possibility that we, that I mentioned earlier of, of analyzing things under different settings um, where like, you know, what if I cared about only privacy over a typical data set? Like people have tried to introduce formalizations of this very hard, but like hypothetically, if I just wanted to know empirically what, what's the lower bound of our typical data set versus the worst case data set, how different are these two worlds? Um, and that we can construct like attacks in any setting we want. And so we can just evaluate this. And the reason why this might be helpful is it might tell us where new assumptions in differential privacy might be helpful. Um, so like, suppose that um, if my attack was just as good on a typical data set as the worst case data set, then this might, this might mean that introducing this assumption that the data set is somehow typical might probably won't help the analysis that much. Um, okay. Uh, or you might, um, oh, I guess this is exactly what I just said here. Um, or this is also this final reason of just like, it's always good to have to be able to like empirically validate the correctness of code, which is proven correct. Uh, I really like this quote by Knuth, um, who says, you know, beware bugs in the above code. I've only proved it correct, not tried it. Um, and like, we see this like in some cases, we, there's a differential privacy um, uh, implementation, which um, because of a bug in how random sampling worked, sampled the same value of randomness every single time. So like if you if you've seen like the XKCD on like get random number return four, uh, you know chosen by fair dice roll, like it's like this is exactly the bug they made, and like every time that they sampled the randomness, they picked the same value of randomness, and like the algorithm was technically correct, like uh, the, the idea of the minds, but like they didn't implement it right, and something like this would have helped discover that. Um, okay, so um, what do we do actually? Um, so the way that we're going to do this is we're going to have we're going to build two functions that are cooperating adversaries. Um, the first of these we call a crafter who's going to construct two data sets A and B. And then it's going to be passed off to some model trainer who goes and trains a model and returns back a model. And then the distinguisher has to guess if the model was trained on A or the model was trained on B. So if I were to sort of draw it as one of these diagrams, it looks like this, where we have the adversary, you craft data set A and B, send it to the model trainer, picks one of these two and returns the model. And then you have to do this guess. Okay, I'm gonna stop now and see if people have questions on, on the setup of what we're gonna try and do. So the model trainer only returns one model. Yes, so we send both data sets. So this is, I guess, sort of one of these standard crypto games. We're sending both um, data sets A and B. The model trainer picks one of these at random and then returns the model trained on that data set. Because if he, the model trainer trained two models and the tasks were for the distinguisher to determine which model was trained on which data set, it might be an easier task. Yeah, I, I think that you can show that up to some constant, they're probably identical. Um, because there's, because, okay, so, so essentially imagine two rounds of this where I send the same, or like N rounds of this, where I send the same data sets A and B multiple times. I, I guess knowing the fact that they were trained, that one was trained on one, one was trained on the other might help you a small amount. I'm not entirely sure, but this, this is, the reason why we do this is this is exactly the setup of the adversary that differential privacy imagines. And so we, we study exactly the, the adversary that differential privacy is imagining.
Okay. Um, so um, the way we use this then is we sort of take this as a black box. And each time the adversary either succeeds or fails. And so we run this like a whole bunch of different times. And then we write down how many times the adversary succeeded, how many times the adversary failed. And as a result of this success and failure rate, it's possible to go and compute the value of epsilon. And here we can say, and again, these numbers are made up. I'm not sure what the answer is. Um, we can say um, epsilon is greater than something. And notice that this is a greater than because we're, this is a concrete attack. And so it's possible that there exists a better strategy with a better, a better crafter and distinguisher, which gives a stronger version of epsilon. Um, but the important thing here is that if we suppose we were training with, with epsilon three privacy, and that means that the proof is telling us epsilon is less than or equal to three. And now we have an attack that says epsilon is greater than or equal to 2.6 or whatever. Then this would tell us that reality is bounded somewhere between these two numbers, and we would have a very good idea of what, what's happening in practice. Um, okay. So how do we actually build um, these crafter and distinguisher functions? That's, I guess, where things become interesting. Um, so the first thing you can imagine is the simplest setting of just membership inference, where our data set A is just MNIST, just you know, standard digit recognition, 10 classes, 50,000 images. Data set B is MNIST plus one random image drawn from the test set. Um, this is like, like the simplest possible uh, crafter you can do that you're just picking a random different image to add to this data set that's from the correct distribution. Um, the distinguisher then has to be able to figure out which data set it was trained on, and, and it's going to do something equally trivial. It's going to look at the confidence in the most likely prediction and say, um, so for example, maybe we're in data set A where it hasn't seen this image. Maybe the confidence is like 0.95. You know, this is a pretty good version of a seven. It's probably reasonably likely as a seven. Um, and, but if we actually trained on this image, then like, you know, it might be much, much more likely. Maybe it's now 0.999. And so, so now we're going to, to do, um, so, so what we're gonna do is we're just gonna set a threshold here um, and figure out um, which like threshold, maybe a threshold at 0.99. Um, and if it's greater than that, we guess yes. And if it's less than that, we guess no. And so we can run this a whole bunch of times and get some empirically observed epsilon. And this is the first half of a figure that I'm going to build out through the, out the rest of the talk, where on the y-axis, I, so I have some value of epsilon, where we're training models with epsilon two differential privacy. So that's what this little dashed red line here is. And this blue bar corresponds to how much, a how much of a lower bound you can set when you run this attack. And the lower bound is, is very low. Like it's, so, so because of how this attack um, is executed, um, th there's a reasonable error bound. So in the worst case, we can basically show like epsilon zero. Um, if, we were, if we were to run a whole bunch more trials, it's possible we can show maybe epsilon like 0 0.2, but this is fairly loose. Uh, so this either means that you know the measured privacy um, upper bound is you know way upper bound, or it means our attack is bad. Um, and in this case, it means the attack is bad. Um, and I can improve this um, by um, so there's just th th there's a paper um, that came out uh, before ours by Matthew Jigelski um, that sort of introduces a technique to do this with a poisoning example. And so um, what Matthew's paper does, and what basically we do a very similar thing here, is um, you instead of saying we're just going to add any image from the test set, we're going to add like a we're going to poison the model and add like a really hard example that the model would otherwise have gotten wrong, but the model can learn to classify correctly pretty easily. And now, when I so I'm going to add the, like this other sort of random image that that's a hard image to classify. And now when I'm doing my distinguisher, it's the same distinguisher, but like it's, it's going to succeed much better more often because the crafter was smarter about how it constructed these data sets. And if I look at the, the model returned in world A, the idea of this image was to have low confidence when it wasn't trained on it. So it's going to be like 0.15 or something. But if I did train on it, then the idea is that it's going to have much higher confidence, maybe something on 0.8. And so now I can do the same thing as setting a threshold. But um, the idea is that um, it's now much, much easier to do this because, because there's a much higher separation between these two worlds. And yeah, so when you do this, things get a lot better. Um, and this, this sort of um, equals basically what, what Matthew's paper finds is that, um, uh, again, because of the number of trials we can run, 
there's some confidence intervals of a 95% confidence interval of where we can say epsilon is less than. So we can say with 95% confidence that epsilon um, is greater than like 0.2 here, uh, which is higher than the previous thing we could say with 50% with confidence. Um, if you only care about 50% confidence, we can say epsilon is greater than one uh, with 50% confidence. Um, and a lot more trials would reduce the error bars here, but because we run something like 2000 trials and each trial means running a machine learning model, it takes a lot of time to run a bunch of trials. And so this is you know, the best that we can do for the time that we have. Okay, is, so far, is everything making sense? When you're, just a quick question, when you're rerunning trials, are you like using the same poison sample or you're just changing the random? Rerunning, yeah, so we're, um, we're, we're rerun, uh, actually, this is a good question. I don't remember if we're changing the poison sample. I don't think that we are. I think that we're just rerunning the, so the training has a bunch of randomness in, in, involved. And I think we're just sampling over the randomness of training. At least not yet, we're not changing the sample, but I'll, we'll, we will in just a second. Um, <clears throat> okay. So, so, so far, again, we're still like fairly far away from this bound. Um, so let's, let's see if we can do, build a better attack. Um, so, um, okay. So the next attack, uh, so previously what I was sort of, this game I was showing you is we have to say A and B, the model trainer goes, and then the trainer returns to F. And this is like the idea of what we, th what we think of differential privacy as. But in reality, what's assumed in the differential privacy analysis is not that this model F is returned. The assumption is that it returns every single intermediate step of the model. Like after every mini batch, um, the adversary gets access to all of these models. Now, this is not a good thing. Like this is because this, this doesn't happen in practice. This is not how the real world looks. But in order to prove that the thing is true, this that we there is no way to constrain the adversary to only looking at the final model update. The, the assumption is sort of the, the analysis of NDPHD doesn't analyze the entire thing as a single whole function, sort of splits it up into a bunch of chunks and just averages it like sort of adds all the chunks together. And the assumption is that after each chunk, the adversary gets to know the output of that chunk, which is the, the mini batch that it was just trained on. So we get like a sequence of a thousand models and we get to look at all of them to guess um, if we can, if, if things are better, if we train on this data set or worse. Or, or not. Um, and so, so here we, we run exactly the same attack on the distinguisher, but we can just average over the, over the results. And this lets us average out a little bit of noise. So if we didn't train on the example, on, on average things are small, sometimes maybe they're a little bigger, sometimes maybe they're a little smaller. If we did train on it, same thing, we can average out some of the noise. Um, and so interestingly, um, this doesn't actually change the answer very much. Uh, we sort of thought <clears throat> that it would, um, now, again, so all these attacks are caveated with this is an attack, a better attack might exist. But um, it was sort of interesting to us that this attack, at least just averaging, doesn't seem to help the adversary very much. Um, and it's roughly, it's a little better, but it's roughly the same as just looking at the final trained model, uh, which possibly means that even if there could be a way to introduce an additional assumption in DPSGD that the adversary can't have access to all the intermediate models, it might not actually matter all that much. Like you might get a little bit of privacy, you're probably not going to get a lot of privacy by being able to introduce this new assumption. Okay, um, so th this is the point where I'm going to switch from like um, pretty PowerPoint pictures to like crypto diagrams um, because it's going to get a little more complicated. Um, <clears throat> so what I'm showing here is this is the diagram of, um, that's like actually real for this um, for the, for this sort of fake one. So let me just walk you through. Um, I'm going to show, you, tell you the same one again, but like a diagram in the paper, just so that it's um, a little more clear exactly what's going on. Um, so the adversary chooses two data sets, D and D prime. Um, this is the crafter that this is the function curly A. Um, we then send D and D prime over to the model trainer. The model trainer randomly chooses a bit, zero or one, and trains a sequence of models um, on, the, um, on, on the data set corresponding to this bit. Uh, they don't reveal the bit to the adversary. They just send the sequence of models back. And then now we, the crafter runs. And the, the goal of the crafter is to predict this bit. This, they're, get, they're getting S, uh, they're guessing S. And the, the input here is the data sets D and D prime and the sequence of models. And then they have to return the, this value S and then the adversary wins if S is equal to B. So this is the same thing I showed you earlier, but just 
Uh, I just put it this way just because I'm going to make things a little more complicated now. Um, and so what we're going to do, I see I have two minutes. So I might not get through all the way through the end, but let me just um, walk you through maybe this one. Um, what we're going to do here um, is it turns out that um, the assumption doesn't like that there's nothing that's assumed in DPSGD that, that prevents the adversary from changing the data set every single mini batch. Uh, the way the analysis works is it's, it's not an analysis over the entire training thing, it's analysis over mini batches. And so every single mini batch, the adversary gets to change the inputs that they're feeding to the, to, to, to the model trainer in order to be the worst possible data sets. Again, they can only differ in one example, but they can feed entirely new data sets every single time. Which is like a very weird thing. Like this, this can't happen like in reality. Like the, no adversary actually gets to do this. But the, the, nothing in the analysis of GPSGD prevents us from doing this. And so like this here is sort of a very strange thing to do to change the data set behind the model training thing every single time. And there's a little bit of a fancy way that we 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 like we take advantage of this. But like this is the core idea is, is that the data set that the model is training on um, always only differs in one example. It's always in the same example, but the, what, the, what the example is changes every time. Um, and it turns out that having this power like actually helps you a lot. Like it sort of goes up by like a factor, like uh, reduces things by roughly half again. And so like here is for example, one thing that if there were a way to, to improve the analysis, um, we could do much better. Uh, we, we might be able to do much better in, in increasing the privacy if we can improve the analysis by, by making some assumption that like, you know, the adversary doesn't get to change the database every single time that they're querying it. Because like in practice, they don't. Um, let me just, I'm not gonna walk through um, exactly what this one's doing, but um, it turns out that the analysis again, isn't even over like databases of examples, it's over databases of gradients. The adversary gets to feed like gradients to the, to, to, the, to the training thing, not, not even, so like gradients have to be gradients of, of some function, but nothing in the analysis assumes that it's gradients of the correct function. So you can just feed like random vectors as if they were gradients and the analysis says, yeah, fine with me. And so you can get even tighter if you do like this ridiculous thing. And finally, we could do like the last ridiculous thing, which is like go over the worst, worst possible data set and not just like all the previous ones were over actual MNIST. If we like do the worst possible data set, then we can match like very, very tightly the, the actual bounds. Um, and so, and the reason why the error bars here are much smaller is because we ran a whole lot more trials here just to get much better confidence. Like um, it, nothing fundamental about this giving smaller uh, reduced variance, we just ran, ran like 2 million of them. Um, yeah, so I guess um, to briefly conclude then, um, DPSGD um, looks like it's tight in the worst case, um, but Possibly, um, if you were to introduce some more realistic assumptions on the adversary, uh, might be able to do to do better. Um, that's all I have. Um, thanks for staying with me an extra minute late. Uh, and I guess maybe email me if you have questions, or maybe I don't know one question or something. Otherwise, uh, thank you all. Thanks, Nick. Nicholas. Um, yeah. So, any any remaining questions? I, I kind of have a question that might be a little bit off topic, um, sure. but so I was wondering if you could speak a little bit about like, I guess the relationship and the strength between membership inference attacks and other kind of related adversarial machine learning attacks like model extraction or something like that. Um, just because earlier you were saying kind of, uh, or you mentioned something about a strength between like when you were talking about InstaHide um, about, I, I didn't really quite catch it, but yeah. yeah, yeah. Right. Just, so, yeah. so the game that we're playing, like when I'm constructing these, these plots is like this, like this, this exactly a different privacy game where it's guess if this, like, we know what the examples are. We know what the data sets are. We just want to guess which one is different, which is like a really, really weak version of privacy. And there are like, you know, all sorts of reasons why this is interesting. It's the standard argument of like, I might as well add my name to the cancer data set because it's going to be just as good with and without me. And you can't tell whether I'm included within it or not. This is like a very weak definition of privacy. There are stronger ones of like, given the model, can I recover individual people's names? Like clearly if you could do that, this would be very bad, but it probably is, if you could convince me 
that I couldn't pull my name out of a machine learning model. That might not be enough because maybe it's enough to know that I'm in the data set or maybe it's enough to know, you know, a misspelling of my name or maybe it's enough to know like, you know, my last name or the first character of my name. And so like, it's very hard to make these arguments in these strong settings about what will or will not matter. The nice thing about differential privacy is it like, is like the strongest thing that you could like could reasonably hope to ask for or something like it and is pretty good in this guarantee side. Okay. Does that answer the question? Um, I, yes, I, I sort of, my question was a little bit about kind of um, slightly different, I guess. Okay. Which is just that, so it, I, I see how differential privacy protects more, it is more protection than just like saying, okay, you can not take out this particular input, somebody's particular like training data. But um, I guess the question is more, so if, you know, if I could take out someone's training data, then would that also allow me to perform other kinds of uh, adversarial ML attacks? Um, specifically the one I'm thinking of is uh, model extraction. So like, if you know what the, what sort of model it is and how it's being trained and I can again, gain some information about um, I see. the training data, is that then enough information to perform other types of attacks? Okay, so the question is, is, is more of if you have access, if you could use, do something to steal the training data, does that help you do something else bad, like learn the model or fool the model or something? Sure, yeah. Uh, yes, it can help, but I don't know of anyone who's actually done this. Like, in, in principle, it could help, but I don't know of anyone who's actually used this to make it help in some strong way. Uh, okay. There is a paper at Oakland that does what they call hyperparameter stealing, where they, like, given a trained model, learn what hyperparameters were used to train this model, and they show that this can help you generate absolute examples. Um, and it's also like, it's, it's, it's clear that if you could um, like, if you could do model extraction, like steal the weights of the model, then this might help do a privacy attack. Like, so like they're, they're, they're related in many ways. Okay. So, but it's, it, it wouldn't be clear you're saying like that one is stronger than the others. Yeah. But I, 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 if I were to guess, I would say many of them can help each other in, in sort of interconnected ways. Okay. Okay, thanks. So um, if there are no more questions, then